Hello, world. Welcome to another episode of Golf Subpar. Colt Nost and Drew Stoltz. Sleazy, what a weekend it was at the United States Open. Man, what a week is right. I feel like we were kind of on the uh, front end of watching history happen there. It, uh, we talked about it last week. I was hoping for a bloodbath. You were hoping for a bloodbath. We got one. It just wasn't exactly the way we thought. I was thinking more of like in terms of winning score relative to par. I was mm-hmm. hoping for five, six, something like that. But we got a bloodbath, and that was just Bryce and DeChambeau ripping the hearts out of the rest of the field, man. It was a pretty, pretty special, special performance. Man. He he put on a clinic all week, and especially on Sunday. And now on to another champion, Sleaze. The champion. The champion of life. Our guest this week, Mr. Mark Mulder. I hate him. Yeah, I absolutely hate him. He's, he's everything I want to be. If you look at this guy and you're being honest and you look at him and be like, that wouldn't that would be pretty nice to have that. Or that wouldn't be I wouldn't <laughs> want to be six five and beautiful and talented and rich. Then I think you're lying to yourself because he's pretty much the the real deal. We're basically the exact opposite person. You two? Yeah. I don't know. I think you got more similar. You're both champions. We are just champions. In different, just different ways. Man, he's got a lot of things I want though. Yeah, a lot of things. A lot of things. But dude, he is a blast to talk to. He had an incredible uh, Major League Baseball career and um, lives a pretty cool life. And uh, like I said, hard yeah. to knock anything about the guy. Hell- also, one of just the nicest guys. Like, he's such Super a down to earth nice. guy. Great dude. Yep. Hell of a golfer, too. Three time American Century Championship winner. Um, basically, just dominates the celebrity golf tour, which, which is awesome. We play a lot of golf with him at Whisper Rock. He is a blast. But let's get right to it. Here's Mark Mulder on Golf Subpar. All right. We are now joined by. Arguably the most genetically gifted man in the history of the world. <laughs> we'll get into a lot of that, I assume, today. He is former Major League Baseball All-Star and also three-time American Century Celebrity Golf Champion. On top of it all, Mr. Mark Mulder. How are we doing, brother? I'm good, guys. How are you? Good to be with you. I hate yeah. sitting next to you. This is... I wish no one could see this. <laughs> this is Yeah, don't watch this on yeah, YouTube. Yeah, I lowered exactly. my chair as much as I could. And it's, I raised mine as high as I could. <laughs> it's best, a problem. It's best that maybe we release this one only audio. <laughs> We've never looked worse in here. Next, right. is that is that a fair argument though? Most, arguably, the most genetically gifted human no. to ever. No, not even close. What do you mean? What are you lacking? Would you say six five? Throw yeah. it hundred miles an hour. Hit six, bombs. Six six, but whatever. Oh, it's okay. Just an inch. Oh, you seem shorter. Flip flops. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's a, that's roster six six. That's not actual six yeah. six. I don't. I don't know what happened. My parents are not even yeah. remotely big. What? Yeah, I was gonna so, say. Are you what one of those? Parents look like my my dad is six foot. My mom's my mom. I guess is tall. She's five nine, but that's not anything crazy my dad is he-man and my mom was superwoman <laughs> my parents weren't even athletic that's that's what's funny you're one of my, those anomalies my, my little brother's six two and he's but he's in special forces so i won't mess with him because he'll kick my ass <laughs> perfect and then my other brother has like a banking job downtown chicago so he's boring wow and then there's you and yeah. then there's and me then there's some which my brother uh, my brothers like to say to me if had i not been good at a sport i would have been a gym teacher do your brother nothing wrong with being a gym teacher yeah do your but, brothers look like you uh, Maybe my, my little, little one, the one who's, who will kick my ass. He's built like me, but he's six two. Maybe talk to your mom. Who do you Maybe think God loves more situation. Please, Him or me? Can you imagine what we'd accomplish <laughs> in this frame, bro? Oh my God. <laughs> Are you joking me? Oh, People had never heard of Rory if we had this <laughs> ever. Well, let's go back to the young days, by the way. Okay. Played a little baseball at Michigan state. Well, yep. what, what made you choose Michigan state? By the way, it's one of my only options. Really? Yeah. I, I mean, I was. I was a good player in high school, but I wasn't, you know, I was what you, I was the first team all state, whatever, yeah. but I wasn't, I threw 86 to 87 miles an hour my senior year of high school. I wasn't recruited very much, um, but I was six, five, a buck 80. Mm. Like I was skinny, you know, and after my freshman year, I probably put on 15 pounds and next thing you know, I'm playing in the County Mac World Series throwing 94, you know, mm. and that was all in about a year, year and a half. So it's just I kind of grew up. I was I needed some muscle. I needed some maturity. But same, <laughs> yeah. Don't we all? Yeah. When's that come? Yeah. I'm not sure. <laughs> okay, I'm still waiting. But, Can you get that at 36? Yeah. yeah, I think so. But the point is, is that just thing. I kind of grew into my body a little bit, and things started clicking, and kind of took off from there. Yeah. Well, boy, did they ever click. I mean, you were taken second overall by the A's yeah. in the 1998 draft behind Pat Burrell. Yeah. Were, were you surprised how high you went, or did you think you were going to be the number one pick? Or? Uh, no, I didn't know if I was going to be one. That that summer, I was in the Cape Cod League, and I remember Peter Gammons, who did ESPN at the time, comes out to do a story on our team because we had a bunch of really good pitchers. And it was it was on TV a few days later, and I'm sitting there watching it. That was when that was the only way you saw this type of stuff. There was no social media and stuff like that. So. I'm sitting there watching ESPN, and all of a sudden he comes on, he does a story, and he kind of ends it with, 
Well, Mark Mulder would be one of the top three picks. Hello. And I'm kind of looking at the host family that I'm with and this other guy who was my roommate. I'm like, what did he just say? Wow. And from the day he did that story, I then had agents the next day at our game chasing me to my car. So all these agents are instantly out to the Cape Cod League. There's agents. There's uh, just you name it, financial people that are out there like, hey, you got a financial person? Well, I haven't even been drafted yet. So it all happened really quickly for me. And my college pitching coach at the time, who's to this day still one of my good buddies, he played in the minor leagues with the Phillies, and he was kind of the one that really helped me with a lot of that stuff. Like, hey, here's what's going to happen. Here's how we need to do it. So that summer, my parents interviewed a handful of agents. I interviewed a few. We picked out our favorites, and then we did it again. And then, sure enough, here comes the draft, and I was picked second. And wow. as Pat Burrell likes to say, how's it feel to be picked that low? Mm. Is that the last you time know. you lost something? Yeah. <laughs> it's good for everyone to experience losing. To me at that time, it didn't feel like a contest, though, because I was so shocked by how quickly this was happening that I didn't know any better, to be well, to be honest. Stay on that Cape Cod League, because that's like the marquee talent yeah. in college, right? Before you turn pro, everyone goes to that Cape Cod League. That's yeah. like the featured league. Was there a Do you have like a chip on your shoulder being like, I'm at Michigan State, none of these schools gave me looks, and now here's all their players coming up? And, and a, like little a little bit, a little bit. The thing was is that I basically got on a Cape Cod League because of my college pitching coach calling in a favor. So I went out there not having any idea what to expect other than, hey, these are a lot of these same guys that I read about in Baseball America which was the one magazine back then that you had to get in order to find out who's good, who's, who are the better players, what their stats are, things like that. And as you get a couple weeks into the Cape Cod League, I start to realize, shit, I'm, a, I'm, I'm just as good as all these guys. You know, plus it was wood bats. So I started eating those bats up because with metal bats, you can, get, you can cheat. You know, you can get away with get the hitters. It, it makes them a lot better. But wood bats, you can't get away with, with a so-so a swing. So... I started dominating that Cape League, and then I was a starting pitcher of the All-Star game of that Cape League tournament, and I'm hitting 96 miles an hour in the, in the All-Star game, and it just kind of blew up from there. That was it. Yeah, and then I went back for my junior year How just fun trying is that not league? to get hurt. How fun is that? Like, that seems well, like a really – it's like, here's all the best players in America. We all go to the same place, play against each other, yeah. just trying to showcase ourselves. But also, you got a whole summer in Cape Cod. It was it was awesome. The problem was is because I it was a favor for me. To, I was on Bourne, which is right over the bridge, which is probably the one town that has a team that there is no beach anywhere near. There is no – it really wasn't the – it wasn't the Chatham. It wasn't the Hyannis. It wasn't some of those unbelievable little towns that you could have been in. So I was in kind of a bootleg place, but, and we had the field, it was such a terrible field that we played on. We had to have sun delays. The sun set in center field. Perfect. Which is so ridiculous. So we had to stop every game for like 20, 30 minutes till the sun set. <laughs> and then the lights would come on and we could finish the game. That's perfect for a pitcher. It like, was, now yeah. let's start this And there's, thing, maybe man. there's a reason I dominated yeah, yeah. that summer. <laughs> this is fourth no hitter in a row. This right? Mark Mulder is unbelievable. Seriously. Oh, I love that. But. You know, you get you get drafted, and you didn't spend very much time in the minor leagues, yeah. less, less than two years. How did it go? Like, does the manager come to you and say, hey, I need to talk to you when you get the call up to the big show? Or do you get a phone call? Um, how, does that, how does that whole process work? To be work? honest, I, I, don't remember, I don't remember much of it. I just remember I was in Salt Lake City. So my first year, I was in AAA the whole year. I never went to A-ball, double-A. I never had to take a bus. Mm. Guys still give me shit about that. But that whole year I spent in AAA, we won the AAA World Series that year. Um, they wanted me to have that experience. So, you know, that years ago when they made a big deal about Chris Bryant getting called up a few weeks into the season, that's what the A's did to me. They called me up two weeks into the season so that I had to play seven full years before I reached free agency. So I got Chris Bryanted before it was a thing, gotcha. if, if that makes yeah, yeah, sense. Because no, you have to have six full years. So I basically had six years and almost just less than two weeks of seven years before I became a free agent. Oh, wow. So they do that to like protect themselves. Yes, like, they don't do. call you up right away. Yeah, Let's give this a few weeks they, and then he's... They have what in baseball what they call a super two. So you end up being paid more, but you still can't reach free agency. And bad luck for me, that's when I hurt my shoulder. So had it been a year prior, God knows mm. what I would have signed for. But it's irrelevant. It's just you... I remember being in Salt Lake. The manager calls me in. And I, I, I don't remember the conversation at all. I, I, I just don't. Um... I know he called me in and said, hey, you're getting called up, this and that. Here's your flight info. Call the travel secretary with the A's. He'll set everything up. And that's what I did. What a moment that had to be. And then you sit yeah. there. And he goes, you're starting, I don't know, 
let's say Friday, and it's a Wednesday, and you're sitting there going, Friday, who they put? And I had to fly to Cleveland. Well, this is 2000 when Cleveland, Manny, uh, Roberto well, Alam, I mean, Albert Kenny Bell? Lofton, Albert Bell, yeah. um, Sexton was still with them, Tommy. Uh, like their lineup was the best lineup in baseball. And you're flying there going, are you oh, really? Boy. This, this is, is how we're going to do I it. have to yeah, face. Maybe one, maybe, let me start Saturday, bro. <laughs> exactly. I feel I'm a more Saturday guy. It's just one of those things where, but hey, you got to you gotta get in there and what get was after that, it. What was that first trip to the mound like in the big leagues? There again, I, I probably floated there. Yeah. You know, it, it, I don't remember being real, I guess you could say nervous. I was never the guy who got nervous. I got anxious. I, I wanted the... We'd have to get to the field so early with baseball. I, I'm, you know, you're there at two o'clock. Game doesn't start till seven. Well, you can't go hit balls. You yeah. can't go do anything like that to get any energy out. So you're not. You're just basically sitting around, and that's the worst. That seems like bad. Like I get guys. Some guys got to get there and hit and do all this stuff. But for, for a pitcher sure. to just sit there for five hours and think about it, like it's the most mental thing. Just like golf, yeah. right? Guys talk about. I got a three thirty tee time. I'm leading the Masters. Like, yeah. dude, it's the worst day ever. Exactly. You guys do that every day. But you baseball. never really wanted to feel rushed. Um, so I, I can't say that I always got there at two o'clock. But everybody's at the field by three three thirty because stretch is at four fifteen somewhere around there. But you know, you're just sitting. I just remember sitting around the clubhouse going, just constantly just looking at the clock going, all right, come on. And then about an hour and a half before the game, that's when you kind of start your process with the trainer and getting your arm loosened up and your body loosened up and stretching and that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, I, 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 I remember giving up Manny. I gave up a homer to Manny opposite field in the very first inning. I ended up getting the win. I pitched all right. I, I gave up two home runs in the game, uh, but we won. And that's... When Manny hit that ball, I threw just this awesome sinker down and away, and he just hits it out to right field, and that's when you kind of go, oh, I guess I'm <laughs> in the big league. big leagues. You know? Because <laughs> yeah. yeah. guys in AAA, they, most guys, they, didn't, they couldn't do that. You know? So now here you are in the big leagues, and you're like, wow. All right. Okay, here we go. I loved Man Ram. Yeah. Loved him. He was incredible. Rewind man. real quick to your AAA. You were in the same rotation on the AAA team with Tim Hudson and Barry Zito. When you guys were there in AAA, did you know, like, the three of us are going to be sick? Or was it, like, is that a rare not, occurrence that all three of you come up and have big careers? Not really, because, so that, my first year in AAA, Hudson started in AA. Zito got drafted that year. So, Hudson, all, all he's, oh, this kid in AA, he's 4-0, oh, he's dominating. He gets called up to AAA. He was probably with us for maybe a month, and we're you know that was back in the day where you had to sit in the stands with the radar gun and chart pitches, and you know I'd have him and he's sitting there throwing ninety three mile an hour sinkers with just this nasty split punching out twelve guys mm. every single start. You're like, all right, um, why is he still here? Meanwhile, the A's sucked. <laughs> you know, they, they I mean, really, that was the years they they were terrible, and so he gets called up right away. Um, and he goes up and he shoves it up in the big league. So you're sitting there going, okay, he did it here and he's doing it there. I can do that. You know, you start to you start to kind of trust yourself. But I struggled that first year in AAA because, like I said, I didn't go to A ball. I didn't go to AA. I didn't have that routine down. I didn't have the knowledge of what it needed to be a professional. You know, and I didn't. I wasn't the person who just flew by the seat of my pants. And I needed some sort of a routine. And I needed to figure out what I needed to do to succeed. And how to go about that. And I think everybody has to, in mm -hmm. some way, shape, or form, have their own routine to prepare yourself. And I didn't, I didn't have that that first year. I, think I was just going off, well, I'm good. Yeah, you see that's, it in golf, too. You know, that's, I was going to say, that's very comparable to professional golf. Like, in college, mm -hmm. you got your coach telling you when to go here, when to eat, when, yes. when we're getting to the golf course. Then you get out there in professional, you're like, uh, now who's, who's going to tell me yeah. what to do? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's all on you. But um, you, you mentioned Zito and Hudson. You all actually live together. Yeah, tell well, me about this. This is good. well. We didn't. We didn't. We didn't live together. Okay. Well, we have bad sources. Yeah. Though. We have shit information. Yes. Yeah. So yeah we, <laughs> we tell your friends to tighten up. We didn't all live together because Hudson got married. He was the one of the three of us who got married right away, right out of college. Uh, he's still married to this day. It was the same college girlfriend, but he was the old guy, you know. And then Barry, when he got called up, he was the San Fran guy. So he went straight to the marina, lived lived there. It was me and Eric Chavez, uh, Mark Ellis, uh, Bobby Crosby towards the end. I would just rent a house in the Bay Area with a pool. I just tried to find one. That was back when you could rent one in the East Bay. Uh, I'd call the real estate check. I need a house with a pool. Why'd you four need or five a pool, rooms. Mark? 
And what did you do? We had are, off you big, are you a big swimmer? <laughs> we had off days. Are you a big swim guy? Yeah, oh, okay. yeah. Got to get your laps in. <laughs> yeah, dude. Yeah, you but, probably could be a you probably could be a good but swimmer. But when you're 22 years old, you need a pool for an off day. You're right. There's reasons for that. I hear you. So not much else. But we would all live together, and we'd all travel together. And when you're during the season, I mean, Huddy and Barry, we'd all hang out on the road, go to dinner. That our Oakland teams were incredible. I mean, we were all so young. Most of us were single. So you land and it's just, a, all right, where are we going to dinner? There were times we'd have 18 of our 25 guys on the roster all at dinner together. Wow. You Who know, picks up that bill? Usually credit card game and mm. a little somebody, roulette. Somebody, a, somebody yeah. wears it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, somebody wears one. it. It's it was always fun making sure that, but you, you know, you find the hot waitress and have her pick the card mm-hmm. and. Well, yeah, the whole you, a game. rookie yeah. always ends up with. Did you it, ever get any you... attention when you're out, or did you kind of struggle a little bit? <laughs> I feel like God, you could get your dauber down. You know what I mean? Probably swinging a miss. I, I'm pretty sure times. I had no game whatsoever. You don't need it, but bro. I thought I did. That's the sad part is you don't need it. You get up there and read the alphabet. They're like, I love you. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to leave? <laughs> I love. Were you a superstitious guy? Because I know you baseball guys can be. Yeah. Very no. Well. I mean, if you call a routine superstitious, then I well, guess was there anything was. weird involved? Yeah, no. like the same underwear or anything like that. No. Damn it! Mm. I like, the only I like thing, weird superstitions. The only yeah. thing I did my once I started having a little success, I never. Uh, the only time I changed my shoes was when I lost, and some of the years I didn't. I'd lose five, six, seven games, eight games, whatever. So I, I wouldn't. I always went to a new pair of shoes after I lost a game, even if you pitched great and it happened to fall on. What if you lose yeah. a one zero? Oh, Change yeah. them up. Yeah. Got to get the dub. Yeah. What about pranks? I love baseball pranks. Mm, the yeah. season's so long. Y'all do so much shit, oh especially pitchers. Gosh. You just sit out there in the outfield and hang out. We had a pitching coach. Rick Peterson was our first pitching coach, and he was the most superstitious person you you could ever imagine. He'd have routines with his water bottle where he <laughs> set it up on a shelf. He'd take it. He'd spit it on the bottom step because he's getting the chew out of his mouth. He'd spit water on the bottom step, then go to the second step, then go to the third step. <laughs> And then while we were hitting, he went and stood in the end of the dugout. Well, in Oakland, when you we had this black uh, kind of rubber floor in the dugout, when the sun was out, it'd get hot. We, Huddy and I would sit there, chew just tons of gum and just put bombs all over there. And he'd go over there and he couldn't stand in his spot because there's just wads of gum <laughs> sitting everywhere. One time Hudson ran up, took the salt shaker, filled up his water bottle with salt. Okay. And he chugs half the bottle. Half the bottle he chugs. Then the second half, that's when he does his little spitting routine. He ch- I mean, there was so much salt in this thing. He's <laughs> gagging in the dugout, half puking. You know, I mean, there's... And then he kept little things in his pockets of his jacket because even if it was 100 degrees, he, our pitching coach wore a jacket. We put all sorts of shit in his pockets and he'd stick his hand in and come out and there's just goo all over his hand, whatever it was. I mean, we didn't do anything. There wasn't anything crazy that we did. And if we did, I don't remember it. I mean, there were, there's things, you know, guys dumping stuff while they're taking a dump in the bathroom, you dumping something over the <laughs> stall, that kind of stuff. But other than that, there's not, there is a lot of time. Just dudes well, yeah. being dudes. 162 games. Yeah. Man, you got a lot of time around each other. I mean, these are guys, you better learn to like some of those people, you know, cause you're around them every day. You're around them more than your family. Mm-hmm. And you were tight with all those guys. Like you mentioned, like Hudson and Zito. Was that the most fun? Like when you first came up to Oakland, single guy living Our, there, was that the most fun time of your like baseball yeah. career? Our 2001 team, because, oh gosh, uh, Jason Isringhausen with Tejada. I think Ellis got called. Mark Ellis got called up that year. Scott Hatterberg, uh, Jermaine Dye. I mean, a lot of these guys are still some of my best friends today. So those 01, 02, when the whole Moneyball movie was based on, like some of those years we had, we had remote control cars all over the infield at two o'clock. We're all down there with remote control cars. We're hitting golf balls. There's railroad tracks behind the stadium, behind center field. And the Raiders built that Mount Davis, they called it, in center field. So we're out there at home plate teeing up seven irons, trying to hit seven irons over Mount Davis. And balls are just clanking off the seats. And they have all the sweets in center field. And some, somebody would hit one thin and just whack off the glass. Luckily, we didn't break anything. But at that time, we were talented. We were young. And to be fair, yeah. we kind of did what we wanted. Yeah. And nobody, what are you going to do? Nobody really you trade said, me because I broke exactly. your window? Yeah. And that, that's not the way you're thinking. But looking back at it, I'm pretty sure that was our... That was our mindset that we just didn't really care. I don't blame you. Did, I love it. When you, you saw the movie Moneyball, obviously, mm-hmm. I'm assuming, right? You were there yeah. during that time. Was What was Billy Bean like? Was he depicted like pretty accurately in that movie? 
Well, Billy's not that good looking. But right. Other than that. But we'll no, get to that. I mean, I mean, He's I think not Brad Pitt. I, to be fair, I thought the movie was great. It was just 90% of it was completely made up and embellished and stuff like that. So the movie was awesome. I thought they did a really good job. It just wasn't true. You know, I mean, a lot of the things that happened, I mean, we, we never saw a lot of the front office stuff. Billy never came down and blew up on us in the clubhouse. He did throw, he would be in the weight room and fire a water bottle off the TV um, when we struggled in the first couple innings, but okay, so what? You know, I mean, that, that was kind of him. I mean, he did leave the stadium around the fifth, sixth inning and just go drive and listen to the game because he couldn't sit and watch it. But other than that, a lot of that stuff was, Art Howe was one of the nicest human beings in all of baseball. And they made him look so bad in that movie. Like he was just a pushover. Um, but to be fair, a lot of that stuff, when they had, at the beginning of the movie, when they ship everybody out and bring in new guys and force Art Howe to play Hatterberg at first base, that I, I'm sure there was some front office drama, but we were playing like shit. So you needed to kind of mix it up, which is what happens with every team. You always make some sort of move and throughout a season there's going to be ups and downs so did you know you were playing like quote unquote billy ball at the time and then he was no. kind of doing things differently than everybody else which a lot of people are now like taking what he did and, no and because the whole perception was oakland doesn't have any money so to say to see them sign free agents to play a certain position that maybe they're not comfortable at that's not that was nothing unusual we weren't shocked by that we lost giambi to the yankees we had to find somebody and Hatterberg was one of my favorite teammates. He was an unbelievable player. And, okay, maybe he wasn't a first baseman, but he wasn't a catcher. And when the guy can flat out hit, you have to find a spot for him. Yeah. And first base is the most logical place to put somebody like that. So while he wasn't a gold glove first baseman, it worked for us. I mean, we were, we were a good team. We didn't need him to be Jason Giambi. Jason wasn't very good defensively, so it wasn't, it wasn't as if anything really changed defensively. Very interesting. I never knew. I didn't know it was. I assumed it was just very, very all true. No, but I thought I'm, it was. We weren't were paying for our. Very nice. I thought it was clubhouse. spot on. Other than you not being in the movie, I thought yeah. that was bullshit. Nah, that's all right. All right. Well, one thing that Drew and I will never experience is getting traded. Yep. So after the 2004 season, you're traded to St. Louis. Did that come as a shock to you at all? And how, um, first off, how does that even like? Is that another thing where the manager calls you in and be like, "Hey, hey, bud, hey no, I, shit. I, I actually, I got a good story. So yes, I am, this. I'm golfing at Whisperock with Eric Chavez. And I think a couple other guys and Dave Stewart, who used to pitch with the A's, who was a uh, Chavi's agent, who then went on to be the D-backs general manager for a little bit, calls Eric on the course and says, hey, I think Mulder's getting traded. Chavi turns to me on the course and says, hey, I hear you, you might be getting traded. <laughs> That's how <laughs> like, you found what? out. No, well, it's not how I found out. But point is, is we're on the course. We have a few holes left. And Chavi's sitting there going, tell him, hey, Stu said you might get traded. I'm like, man, they're not trading me. Why would they trade me? You know, I, I still had one more year, I think, till I was a free agent. So you're not thinking anything of it. I drive home from the course. I was meeting my parents because I don't know if we had a family friend or in town or what, but my parents were at my house. I pull into the garage. My dad opens up the door going into the garage, and he looks at me. He goes, Billy Bean's on the phone. Get in here. He had called my home phone. So I go walking in, and it's Billy. He's like, hey, dude, uh, traded you to the Cardinals. <laughs> I'm like, huh? What? And they had just traded Tim Hudson to the Braves two days earlier, which that's why it came as even more of a shock. Like, why would they now trade me? But long story short, Billy was awesome about it because Billy took over the general manager job right as I signed out of college. So Billy and I had a great relationship. And he said to me on the phone, he's like, listen, dude, this is not what I wanted to do. But with you two being free agents next year, he kind of went into a little bit of a story. He's like, listen, there were a couple other teams interested, but I didn't want to put you in that bad. I've heard that it was maybe Pittsburgh or Tampa or, you know, he's like, I'm not sending you there. I tried to put you in the best possible situation as I could. You're going to St. Louis, this and that. They're an awesome team. And, you know, they're coming off losing to the World Series the mm -hmm. year before. So it was disappointing, but yet exciting because I went from a straight, young crazy team to this uber veteran unbelievably talented experienced team so it yes it was a shock but it was also kind of exciting to be going to that good of a team 
Do you hold a grudge? I feel like athletes, especially guys that reach the top level, like you, you're uber competitive. Like you are yeah. diehard comp- competitor. When you get traded, like that puts a chip on your shoulder. You you take that as a slight. Like how did? Obviously, you're excited to be going to a good team yeah. like St. Louis, but are you also like screw you? I'm going to show you. I I wasn't. I, I was very disappointed to be fair because I think when you're young and you you make it to the biggest, you just think I'm going to be here forever. That that's your you're not thinking about being traded. You're not, you're not looking at things like that. I was, I was, I didn't know what I was doing the next day. You know, you're young. So it's just, you're flying by the seat of your pants. You just, you just did whatever you wanted at that time. You have a little success. You have a little bit of money. You didn't care about anything. You know, you're kind of into yourself. I think, I think more than anything, I probably was. And you get traded and it was kind of a big wake up call. Like, oh, okay, this, this is real. This can happen at any given time. And so you get traded and then you're, now, Jason Isringhausen, who I knew was one of my best friends with the A's, he was the closer for the Cardinals. So going, he really helped with that transition to something new that took me by surprise, I guess you could say. He was on the phone with me right away going, hey, dude, this is going to be awesome. Um, so I was excited about it. And to be fair, it was it was incredible. It was an awesome experience playing in a smaller town like that with an unbelievable fan base. Yeah, that's a fun baseball town. I've only mm-hmm. been to a couple games there. That town is gets yeah. behind them, and it is sweet down yeah. there. Well, if you're going to get traded somewhere, that's a good spot. And plus, you know, now there was no football. There's, there was right. no uh, basketball. Hockey is still big there. Right. But that was – everything was about the Cardinals the minute the season started. Yeah, you're the show. Yeah. And you started struggling with some injuries. I don't want to get mm-hmm. into that because it's sad, and I don't like injuries. <laughs> but in 2006, I heard one of the coolest moments of your career happen. Bush Stadium opens, and you're the – Oh yeah, you're the pitcher for the I first ever game. Day. Yeah, and you also hit a home run. Yeah. in the game, it was a bomb. Why wouldn't it was a bomb? Why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you hit a yak and <laughs> pitch in the? I same mean, how game? cool Seriously. is that though? It was. Was yours the first home run ever hit in the stadium? Uh, no, I gave up the first. Okay, nice. Good. All right, double I, record. Dude. Yeah, double record. I, I don't actually. It might have been Carlos Lee. Used to be with the Cubs. I think maybe that was him. He was with the. It was the Brewers who we played. But I gave up the first. I believe Albert hit the second one. Pools at the second one, and then I hit the third one. But what's funny is the at-bat before that homer, I hit a double off the center field wall, which I actually hit way better than the homer. And I knew I got the homer. I mean, there's video of that if you, if you need to find <laughs> you it. So you can you pitch, pitch and we, we can find it. Perfect. Yeah. You hit bombs in high school. Weren't you a first baseman yeah. like, coming I, up too? I could, and I hit all through college too. So it wasn't like I didn't know what I was doing. It's just the problem is all the years in Oakland, yeah. we didn't hit at all. We had interleague play. Kenny Rogers, the year before I got there, blows out his rib cage from trying to hit homers in BP. So they shut down BP. So we took no hitting. I mean, basically for four or five years, I did barely hit at all. But my first big league camp in 99, I'm right out of college. I hit a homer uh, against the Rockies in a big league game in spring training too. So like I knew, I knew what I was doing. It's just I didn't do it for so long. That's so cool, though. You know, are you the only pitcher ever to get traded to a team like, yes, now I get to bat? Oh, yeah. I yeah. was jacked for that. What are the, do the coaches coach you up different? Like most pitchers, I feel like they just say, stand there, try to do it. Are you there, like, to try to send <clears throat> well, it? Well, with the National League, it, they do work on it a little, you know, because it can be a big weapon if the pitcher can hit right. or handle the bat, move a runner over. But, I mean, we bunted all the freaking time in spring training. But it was awesome taking BP because – they, I, they're not sitting there saying, all right, let's see how far you can hit it. Because they don't want you getting hurt in BP, and nor do you want to get hurt trying to do something stupid. But the point is you're hitting every day prior to the game. So you're, you're getting better, you know. But when you're facing 90 to 96, and then they throw a little wrinkle in there, sometimes you just – you had no chance. I mean, there were times I got up in the box going, nope. nope. Do you nope. do, what, what do you do? I feel like hitting a baseball might be the hardest thing in sports. Do you just like, are you actually of those seeing are, the ball? Or are you just swinging yeah. and being like, it's going to be somewhere around the zone? And no, hopefully you I can hit it. see it. It's just you try to, as, as a pitcher, we don't have the bat speed all those other guys have. So you're just trying to be short to the ball and just almost, if you're going to compare it to golf, have a fairway finder swing. You know, you're just trying to be short and just put something in play. That's all I got. Just eat you, <laughs> eat you row that True. thing. That's True. all I got. Yeah, that's the cult's yeah, career. Kind of. you're, you're just trying to put the ball in play. Hit. Find a barrel. Find a way to barrel the ball up and hit something hard. That's all. And you hit a yak in your yeah. first game. Nice. Yeah. Tough, you go. Bro- tough break, Mark. Why wouldn't you? Yeah, things will turn around, dude. Yeah. You just keep plugging. We'll you, get there someday. You huh? keep doing what you're doing. Should we? Uh, should we get to some golf? Let's talk. We're a golf podcast, yeah, we'll dude. Golf and you're right. a great golfer. Let's dude. do yeah. that. You know well, what I mean? that's debatable. Come on. You're By the way, I mean, golfer. the celebrity major is the American Century Championship out of Lake Tahoe. You're a three-time, back to back to back, three-peat champ. 
talk, talk us through that week. Like, first of all, I know that's a week you look forward to a lot. Oh, How well, much fun is it? What are some other than the golf? What are some of the best parts of that week? Um, jeez, just being being able to play golf where you're so nervous on the first tee that my hands shaking. See, I was going to ask. It you is to get nervous. Awesome. Yeah. I, I love it because when you compete your whole career, you're you're competing whether it's high school, college, and then my baseball career ended. And now what? I'm at home. We have a couple little kids, and you're you're sitting there going, "How do you? How do I fill that void? Because mm-hmm. there is a void. You you you've done a sport. You've competed against other people your entire life, from as long as you can remember, and now it's done. Mm-hmm. So to get invited to the American Century and to be able to compete like that, or just play any amateur golf, that American Century the first year. I went out there going, and I, I watched it. I remember watching it when I was still playing baseball going, I'm going to play in that and I'm going to win it. Mm-hmm. It was it was a goal of mine. And so when you when I finally got in, the round one, I actually played really well the very first year. And round two, I was probably in second or third place. And round two, I I think I had like four points. <laughs> I'm, I'm not kidding. I was so you get nervous. points for par in this. You get a point yeah, for you get par. A point for a par. And I'm pretty sure I had four points on day two and just completely blew up. Because I'd never played competitive golf like that, mm-hmm. so it was, it was a a big eye opener. You know, here comes a camera, Dottie Pepper on the camera, and <laughs> you're sitting there. She's right behind you. You're going, I, I can't hit this ball. Go away, lady. Yeah, yeah. I don't want you to watch me. I mean, I've few- never been that uncomfortable doing playing a sport in my entire life than That's the first awesome. couple of years of playing in the American Century. That's great to hear that. Guys that have been on the biggest stages in the world, they're like I get in the American Century and I can't even breathe. It's yeah. fun. What's your level of seriousness? Because we had Jim McMahon on here before, and he's an <gasps> unbelievable dude. But he goes up there, and he has a good time. A lot yeah. of guys go up there and get after it. Right, what's your like? Because you've won. Yeah. Are you going up there and like, hey, I'm laser focused on golf? Or you like to get up and mix it up too? No, because I won't play well if I'm too locked in. If I take it too serious, I won't play well. I'm still boozing on the course. Yeah, I mean, we're we all are. Well, yeah. not all of us, but most of us. <laughs> I mean, it's. There, there's, there's not many guys who are, haven't had at least one cocktail at some point during their round of that thing. Um, cause I, I just, my favorite round, I think it was the second, I think it was the second year that I won the thing. I got paired one of the, the second or third day. Oh no, it was the last day with Erlacher and Ronick. Mm, okay. And it's the three of us. We are going down 16. I'm up by a couple points and we're, we did a fireball shot walking down the fairway. Hell yeah. We're chest bumping after birdies. We're all pulling for each other. I mean, it was it was my favorite round that I've ever had in in Tahoe that, playing in that American century. You're That's one of the it. few guys that can take a chest bump from Erlacher. Yeah, I I, or Ronick, so I yeah. just wouldn't suggest it yeah. though, to be honest. I mean, I'm taller. Give me a but fist bump. <laughs> yeah. It was I mean, it was we were laughing the entire day. Ronick obviously is off the charts energy wise when it comes to the fans, <laughs> that kind of stuff. <laughs> But it, it was it was one of the greatest days ever. And then to go on and win it, I think that was the second year. But to go, go win it with those guys, it was even better. Because the first year, the day before, I've known JR for quite some time. And, you know, there's Ronick and Saberhagen and a few guys. The first year I won it, all standing on the back of the 18th green, waiting for me when I won. You know, and, and that, mean, that means a lot. And, and I know you guys have some of those same experiences. I see guys waiting and... You know, to have some good buddies there actually pulling for you and that kind of stuff, it's it's really cool. I was always the guy waiting. No one was waiting on me. <laughs> I was always the, always the guy texting from my couch. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Good was, job, I was never guys. Even on Way property. to go. Cool, dude. dude yeah. Do it. I want to ask you this. So it's it's Stableford format. You, yeah. get, you get a point for a par. If you make 54 straight pars, 54 points. Yeah. Okay. It normally takes between 70 and 80 points to win an yeah. it normally. What do you think an average PGA Tour player, how many points would he get in 54 holes? I would probably guess 110. So he'd win by a lot. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's 6,900 yards at altitude. I don't even know if it's quite that far. Well, that's what they say on the scorecard. Yeah, it's, like, it's probably not quite that far. But, yeah, I would guess. And the only reason I would guess probably at least that was because they do another one called the Diamond Resorts that the first or second year they did it, we were paired with the Champions Tour guys. Mm-hmm. And they did the same format we did. And I believe that year, Woody Austin and I won it. Um, and Woody, I think, had 106 points. Wow. And yeah. I think I had right around 80, 75 or 80, whatever it is. But the point is, is that's a Champions Tour guy. Mm-hmm. I get it. They can all play, but it's not the point. It's just that 
it's going to be a hundred something yeah. that they're going to go get. So when people watch the American century and they're like, wow, Romo, Mulder, whoever, you, you guys are good. No, we're not. <laughs> you're celebrity no, we're really good. Not. You're, you're celebrity, celebrity good. Yes, good. absolutely. Yeah. See, and that, that brings me to my next question because you're very, I've heard you say, talk about this and I love what you say. You're one of the few that really gets it. In 2018, you played the Safeway Open. Yeah. And you played played all right. You had a yeah. couple under the first day. Yeah. Ended up missing the cut. But there's some athletes out there, not going to name names, that think they can compete on the PGA no, Tour. No, name a name, Colt. Um, Who are you talking about? Not going to name a name. All right. But do you think we'll ever see an athlete from another sport be able to actually make a cut on the PGA Tour? <clears throat> I would highly doubt it. I mean, unless that unless this person comes along years later and grew up playing tons of competitive mm -hmm. golf and – maybe had the ability to go play professional golf, but chose another sport. Talk about how different I, it is. Cause I mean, you've, you played with a ton of PJ tour guys. <clears throat> Gosh, man. I, it, it's hard for me to really describe other than it'd be, I think your joke was, which I think was very <laughs> fittingly. Yes. If I went and started the little league world series next week, I think I could do pretty well. Yeah. We were playing the that, club championship at uh, pine Canyon and we were, I shot 66 the first day and was winning by six over him. And we got done. We we're in the locker room. Everybody's jacking around. I was like, Mulder, this would be like you pitching in the Little League World Series. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Just not a fair fight. That's, that's the amount of yeah. success I think I could go have that he could have yeah. playing on a celebrity tour. I, I, I mean, get it's famous. It, it's yeah, the, you got half of it down already. Yeah. You just got to get famous. When I got in that Safeway, I I was never so scared of my game of losing my game, mm. like having it go away from me mid round and not being able to get it back. I I was terrified of that i was also terrified of making i don't know a 12 <laughs> a 15 it, it could happen yeah you know and i made that the first day i think i shot 75 with a triple and a double yeah you were 200 like played, five to play yeah shot 75, I played, 74 you played good you I beat played a couple tour pros awesome and i told people i've never been so thrilled to finish third from last in anything in my life <laughs> i mean i left that going yes like, it was such a success in my part because I was so scared of it going in that when I did get the invite, when I got the sponsor's invite, I wanted so badly to tell the guy no. I really did. And then I sat there and every, all buddies, and I, I might have, you might have been the ones I, I asked mm -hmm. a ton of the tour guys, is this something I should go do? Like, is it bad of me to take this spot? Is it, and every single person was like, go do it. See, when are you ever, yeah. you'll never get another chance. Yeah. It's a once in a lifetime experience. And, even the the the, one, the guy that I got the sponsor's invite said to me, he goes, listen, if you think this sponsor's invite is going to just the next man up, it's not. Thank there you. you go. We're exactly. picking somebody to give this to. We just happen to be picking you. Yeah. Which that did make a lot of sense. Yeah. He's like, you're not taking this from somebody. That's, you're not taking an opportunity from me, somebody. That's where nuts. everyone gets yeah. it wrong. On Twitter, like, yeah. taking oh, a spot. Yeah, Romo, Steph Curry, they're taking a spot. No, they're not. No, they're yeah. not. These this, these tournaments can bring anyone in they want. They have Most of them have four. They yeah. can bring anyone they want. They want to bring someone in that'll sell some tickets, that'll get some attention to the event. The next man up is not getting that spot. Yeah, yeah. first guy out in Category I'm 6 so glad you ain't getting yeah. it done. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so I got no issue. But, I mean, I've seen in past, I think the Safeway, they've given an invite to, like, one of the Cal – yeah. Uh, college golfers. Mm -hmm. I mean, so it's an opportunity. Yeah. It's an opportunity to do maybe a once in a lifetime thing. And in the big scheme of it, I couldn't possibly turn it down. That's so cool. If you get another invite to anywhere, would you do it again? I don't know. Are you ready? No. <laughs> You're Pine Canyon club <laughs> champ, dude. Yeah, you true. know what I mean? You're yeah. coming off a dub. By, by default, maybe. But no, I, I guess it would be hard for me to turn it down. But trust me, I'm not. I, I'm in no way, shape or form looking for something like that or wanting it, you know? Who are the guys at the Safeway that you went up? Like, did you go up and, like, ask for advice or any tips or anything like that? Any guys, like, as a sounding board? Um, I mean, I had a couple conversations with whether it was Chez or Pat or Perez or I, – I mean, I – hey, what do, what do I expect? What, to, what do I – what is there to expect? You know, Brandon Harkins I played a practice round with. Um, the, I'll, I'll tell you, on Wednesday – no, Tuesday – they, the course was closed. I went out. I played in Johnny Miller's pro on Monday. Tuesday, the course was closed to spectators. And it was just all the tour guys. I've never felt more uncomfortable walking onto a driving range in my entire life. It's, <laughs> okay. it's round one of the new season. Mm -hmm. So I walk out. There is every club rep, every agent, every everything. And I walk out and this range is packed. And I'm a foot taller than everyone on the range. 
and you could tell, and I, and the range is filled. So I'm sitting there with my buddy and I don't know, there was a couple other people that I knew standing there and I'm sitting there. Please tell me some spots on the left side of the range are going to open. Just not the right. Sure as shit. There's two on the right. The guy's working there. Like, hey, you can take that one. I was like, no, no. Great. And I walk up and you just feel these eyes kind of like, well, let's see what his swing looks like. And I, you know, I stretch a little more and just trying to delay it as long as I can. And I think I took out a wedge or a nine iron. And I'm like, please don't chunk it, please. And that was about as uncomfortable as it got. Other than the first tee, I but the that. fact that it was a driver on the first tee was the greatest thing ever. Cause I just wanted it going that direction. You can put the club on the ball yeah. with driver. Seriously. If you got a three wood, uh, three wood or a rescue. I might, I could hit a little hook, you know, whatever a it toppy, is, but a little toppy right yeah, off one driver was just, but it was funny. So we played, I went out for that practice run on Tuesday with Harkins and a couple other guys stripe a driver right down the middle. I have pitching wedge into the green and I thin it. I basically ground ball it. Uh, over the back of the green beautiful and he looks at me he goes really you're ready <laughs> you're ready yeah. you're ready exactly by the way some advice if you ever do do this again don't go to pat perez and ask for advice well i can already hear him he's like hey pat you got any advice yeah book your plane ticket for friday yeah, oh, yeah. I mean, friday afternoon about, yeah just, just go home a lot of things mentor is not one no but. well it wasn't you know i guess i wasn't exactly looking for advice i was just looking more because i'm such a a prep guy a routine person you're just Hey, how does this all work? How, how, what's it like on the range? What, what's it like? I was just looking for that kind of stuff because I, I didn't know what to expect. I love it. How much free shit do you walk out of there yeah, with? Yeah, that's always a good Callaway, question. I love you. Ping, I also love you. You know, Taylor to be Bay. honest with you, I guess there was a little bit, but I was already playing the Mira Irons and stuff, so it wasn't, wasn't like you're going into the tour van to try to get free stuff. I just, dude, I was just kind of head down. Let's not screw this up. Don't like stand it. out. You know what Do I mean? Not, yes, other exactly. than my height. Don't that was kind out. of my goal. I love it. Well, I think we could talk about we could talk with you all day, obviously, <laughs> but we got stuff to do. We got to get to emergency nine. Something we do with every okay. single guest. Some fun, nine fun questions. And Sleaze, I believe you want to start it out this week. I will lead this off. We ask this to everyone. I'm interested on this one for you. Movie being made about the life about your life. Who do you want playing the role of Mark Mulder? The pool is small for you, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> I struggled. I pride myself on this, and I struggled. Oh man. Um, I said someone created in a lab. Yeah. I I, play Aiken and Adam Lambert created somebody. (laughs) I think it would look a lot. (laughs) Hey, Dr. Aiken, what do you you like? I've never been that person. I never had people say, oh, you look like this actor. You look like this. The only person, uh, Scott Speedman or something. What's he? Who is he? He was on some show Felicity way back in the day. Mm. Probably ugly. I don't know. I, I had people back in the day tell me that's who I look like. I this is the first guy I'll we've had on who's that. picking an actor who's uglier than him. I know. <laughs> that's why it's impossible. John Daly picked Matt Damon. We got all kinds of different shit. And like, you're the first guy that's got to have a demotion. I'm not sure how many. Uh, there's not many actors even over six feet tall. So. My guy's not. Who would you have for him? Do you want to see Scott Speedman? Yeah, that's the person. Everybody kept saying that to me. I don't know. Oh, he's like I, a, I didn't have an he's answer. He's a knockoff version. That's, uh, I said someone created in a lab. I, was oh, you said, I said Rob Lowe. Okay. He's pretty much. He's probably five yeah. nine. You could do like a taller. Yeah, if, if Tom Hardy was taller. Like I don't that, think Rob right. Lowe can throw a hundred mile an hour no. either. But looks wise, I don't know. Handle it. Number right. two, your caddy at Tahoe, the American Century, says you're rather high maintenance. Okay. What's his most important job during the week? Uh, hmm. Hand me my drink when I need it. Yeah, that's what. Go. That was the correct answer. Yeah, Keep right your Gatorade one. bottle full. Yeah. Yeah. What, okay. What's in the Gatorade bottle? What's the drink of choice at Tahoe? Uh, a little Madras. A little Tito's mm-hmm. OJ Crayon. Yeah. That's kind of. It's a nice cruiser drink. Yeah. Just keep you level. Chill. Keep you level. That's that's his only job is to keep my BAC right where it needs to be. How does he refill it, though? I, I, you got through six holes. There's no drink um, out there. No, there's tents. There's tents he sneaks into. Oh, he into just sneaks and, into like the spectator I'm not tent. drinking that much, to be fair. Just, you just, just need take just the edge to off. take the edge yeah, off. I get it. But yeah, he probably needs to refill once. During the round? All right. That's plenty. Yeah. Big, big ass Gatorade water bottle. That's like 12 <laughs> drinks. All right. You don't have a problem at all. You're totally fine. All right. Next question. This is my only serious one. Over your career, who is the one hitter you're most scared to throw to? Mm. Barry Bonds. Yeah. That's Not even close. Nice. I get it. I, I figured <laughs> that sense. would be it. But he I was, there might be a different He guy. was 10 times better. He, he could wait. Uh, a, it seemed as though a second or two longer than every other hitter to recognize the pitch. He would hit pitches that you're like, how could you possibly be looking for that? 
You know, it just it didn't make sense. How What's your was. goal when Barry Bonds up? Is it just like get out of this? Even if I walk him, just don't let him hit one yeah, into kind the freaking cove. The year he hit, he, the year he set the record, I think he had number thirty-seven and thirty-eight off me. A back to back and eight. shot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no. Well, it was probably. I don't know. I doubt it was two consecutive at bats, but he he did get two off me that game. But I started getting him out. I I had to face him in one of the All Star games, and I said to a couple of my buddies, I go, if I'm going to give up a huge homer in an All Star game. It's going to be off my best pitch. So I threw him sinkers right down the middle of the plate. And he popped it straight up. Him and Itro were the only guys the last couple of years that I started facing him. I threw fastballs right down the middle of the plate because I almost felt as though they didn't know what to do with that pitch because they never, they never got see it. it. Yeah. They never got that pitch. So I started throwing fat I, right down the middle. And Itro would ground out to second base and Barry would pop it up. I was like, I wish I would have done That's this. That's a four bold years strategy, earlier. by the way, because they get well, on one. Yeah, but Barry gets I, 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 I think Barry also liked facing me and Hudson and Zito and stuff because we went right after him. You know, I, I wasn't afraid to give up a bomb to him. I, it was better than walking him. I mean, a big situation, yes, you're going to be careful with him, but even when you're careful with him, you're more likely to make a mistake than when you're being aggressive. Go right at his ass. Yeah, exactly. That's yeah. so cool. Home run king. Barry Bob. Yeah, I ain't afraid of you. <laughs> yeah. All right, number four. After you played, you did some TV work. Okay. Are you mad that Michael Jordan gets all the credit for your legendary quote, the ceiling is the roof? Mm. Yeah. I feel like you got shorted on that, bro. You were ahead of your time. I did. I, I, I said that about Steven Strasburg. And I don't know. God. Can you please just define what that means? I, I, I've heard Michael say it. I don't even know. It's when your mouth gets moving faster than your brain. Yeah, and, you start going and yeah. you're just like, gosh, the ceilings are. What did I say? I don't know if I said it exactly like that, but I, I said I, I said something just absurd, and you say it. Wait, did I say that right? Wait, what did I just say? And you're thinking that all while you're talking about something, and this was, and then you start to sweat. Mm -hmm. and the lights in some of the studios are so hot. You're full jacket tie, and next thing you know, you're like, "Thank God I have a jacket on because I'm sweating through everything I'm wearing," because you're sitting there thinking. And this, that was towards the beginning of Twitter. Yeah, that's it. So you're like, I'm getting buried. Mm -hmm. Somebody's just burying <laughs> me right now. You know, and it's, your, your head's just spinning. And then for the next five, next five minute little thing you're doing, you can't think about anything other than what you might have just said. Yeah, I'm getting memed right well, now. Yeah. To be fair, like every thing I Googled and YouTube, it's all Michael Jordan at the Dean Dome talking about. Yeah. So you got off the hook. Perfect. Since MJ said it as well. <laughs> Yeah, that's one of the only nobody guys that could, could take the light from you. Yeah, yeah nobody MJ, cared say enough. something stupid exactly how I said it. All right, next question. So we're talking about how good you are at everything. Name one thing you suck at. Um, How's your math? I feel like you're... Oh, school, I suck. Okay, that's good. I was like a BC student. Yeah, I judged. I didn't care. I, I assumed that. I didn't try. Just looking at you. I mean, if it comes to something... <laughs> I don't know. I'm trying to think of a sport that I'm really, really bad at. I don't know. I'm Can not. you play pool? Yeah. Darts? Yeah. yeah. Are you the best um, dart player? Yeah, you've no, taken throw not, for a living. No, it's oh, not. Really? I'm trust me, I'm not great at pool, but I'm I'm fine. So you're good at everything except for your brain sucks. When it comes to hand eye <laughs> stuff, yeah. Okay. I mean it's I don't lack in a hand eye. Yeah, department. I mean if you got that, you're I don't know. Yeah, spell xylophone. No, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Next question. In nineteen eighty eight, the incredible incredible movie Twins was created mm. about a genetically perfect specimen played by Arnold Schwarzenegger who meets his pint-sized, wise guy, long-lost twin played by Danny DeVito. Yep. The movie made $216 million. I've heard they're working on the sequel, and they need two guys for leading roles. Are you in? I'm in. You and Let's me, buddy. This. By the way, I did some more research on this. So Schwarzenegger and DeVito. That's all they made? No. No, listen. <laughs> they didn't take their normal That's salary. A... They took twenty percent of the oh. box office, so twenty percent of two hundred sixteen million. Huh. What's we... the number on that? Go. Uh, his brain sucks. No. Forty-two million. Forty. I was just gonna say oh, forty. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Close enough. All right. So me and you, we're in. All right. You guys are in. I get. Are you him. the weird twin or the specimen? Yeah. Who's who in <laughs> yeah. this oh, in this the, film? The you're the pipe size. Yeah. You're the little like tag, the... tag along guy. Yeah. Yeah. You're a little. I'm the one challenged. The little mascot. Mm -hmm. All right. Serious question here. Were you offended when Paris Hilton decided to date Barry Zito instead of you? <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were kidding when you said you were going to ask that. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was a real question. Did that had to sting a little. You did think they she ever had... really date? I've, I've, it's on the internet, so it's true. Uh, I remember when he was with Alyssa Milano. Yeah, that's another one. She I was just, nuts. I picked um, Paris instead. She was nuts. <laughs> There's good stories there. Can't get into that. Um, <laughs> you think Paris wasn't wearing her contacts or something when, when she bumped into the two of you for the first time? I, I didn't meet her. You never met her? No. Oh, really? Your uh -uh. boy was dating her. You didn't. 
See, that's what I he mean. He probably I kept I her away from you. That might have been an off season thing when he was doing the whole Hollywood, living yeah. up in the hills with it in his mansion. You think you're going to bring a girl around him? Yeah, if that's he's the single? worst idea of ever. Hey, Shark, you want some blood? It was yeah. no. It was more fun hearing Barry's Hollywood stories. Yeah, he was in it because he was he was in, it. in that scene. You, you never know, dabbled. But, you didn't dip your toe no, in that water. Uh uh-uh. uh <laughs> No. Why not? not What's a, the point of being a famous, good-looking celebrity if you can't dip, dabble in Hollywood? Not not the way. Not not like he did. I don't even want to be famous. That was anymore. that okay. was that, that fit him <laughs> at that time. That fit him perfect. He he loved that. I that wasn't for you me. You had a good run. Yeah. Roster was stacked. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. Not offended. <laughs> Number eight. No. When Tony Romo retired from football, whose income was affected more, yours or Phil Sims? <laughs> I, I, I would guess it would have to be Phil. Yeah. Because there were a few years where I still won the American Century. Oh, I love it. <laughs> Sorry, Phil. Yeah. I think he's doing I think he's probably still doing all right. You both. It. Is he your who's your celebrity rival right now? Going into Tahoe next year, who are you like, I need that guy's ass on a platter? Uh, Tony and Marty Fish. Okay, good. Yeah, right, yeah, but at least open. yeah, but Tony, if he's getting beat, he just bolts. <laughs> he did. <laughs> I, he, he did. He did. It. Yeah, he did leave this year. Mm-hmm. But he had a some injury, I guess. Wrist. Sometimes you got to just know. retreat. He practices yeah. more than any tour player. Of course, he's going to get hurt. Yeah. See, I I can't practice. No, I'm with you. No, you have raw don't talent. Do you don't need to pr- practice. Is the crutch of the yeah, talentless. That's tough. To you do. know what I mean? All right. Last question. Okay. Serious one. Also, is it true? That you vetoed having your character featured in Moneyball because Brad Pitt was already playing Billy Bean and you felt no one else was good looking enough to play you. <laughs> I heard that, dude. It's on. It was on TMZ. It's on. It, it might. It might have been. I don't know. I I was supposed to actually play myself in that movie for a for a very small part. Of course he was because no one else could that do was, it. Well, th- no, there were supposed to be some locker room scenes, and that could get weird. But Shower, there were supposed to be some locker room scenes. scenes. Yeah. Um, uh, gosh, I can't. The guy who was uh, first supposed to. There was an original director to the movie, and then it changed. Now I can't. I'm spacing on his name, but he called me to confirm a bunch of stories, and he said, "Okay, you need. Um, well, we need you at the. If you can make it, it was going to be at Phoenix Muni. So I was like, "Yeah, it's just a short drive." And he's like, "We're going to have clothes for you guys that fits that time. This and that." He's like, "Just show up." At eight o'clock at night, I get a phone call that says, "Movie's off. You don't need to be there the next morning." What? Okay. No problem. I never filled out anything. I never did anything. All I think I did was send my address and my name to Sony or something. That's who was supposed to do the movie the first time. And about a month later, a $7,000 check shows up in the mail. That's from Sony. Yep. And, you and you're nothing. sitting there going, what is, what is this? And I called great. my agent. He goes, yeah. He goes, I guess they're, they were supposed to pay you for something. I was like, wait, I was getting paid to go do that? I don't know. Seven grand when it shows That's up. That's the life of Mark Mulder. Yeah, keep your chins up, Mark. <laughs> yeah, get better. Exactly, dude. <laughs> dude, After well, every money. dark night, there's a bright day, yeah. Mark. You're going to be all right, bud. Well, Mark, thanks so much for joining us, man. This has been yeah. an absolute blast. Enjoy we it, love guys. you, dude. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. And that was the beautiful Mark Mulder <laughs> joining us on Golf Subpar. So, ladies, I mean, I still hate him just because he's so perfect. Do you but, think, God, he's fun to talk to. Do you think we got our point across and that we're jealous of his entire physical makeup? Did we say it enough? I feel like we said it 82 different times, like, why are you like? Why are yeah. you the way that you are? Why I don't are even, you so perfect? I know it's just it's just not fair. But no. you know what? He first off, he, you can see why he did some TV after he played. He's very well spoken. Um, just an absolutely awesome interview. Yeah, he he's a blast to talk to. He's going to be a monster on that celebrity circuit. And um, there's not a lot the guy can't do. I asked him, "What do you suck at?" And he literally can't come uh, up with a question. If he if he committed himself to bowling tomorrow, I think he could probably be a professional bowler in a year. First off, what a, what a life this guy has lived, by the way. I loved when you when we said that he was the second overall pick in the 98 draft, and you go, is that the worst defeat of your life? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, how to feel to lose. To the whole draft. Yeah. How to feel to be second best one time in your life, you privileged bastard. Dude, I know. It's unbelievable. But, man, he's just – he's so talented. I mean, if it wasn't for the injuries, I mean, yeah. no telling what kind of career he would have had. Yeah. But, you tried uh, to make that comeback. I always joke with him. I was like, you're only Achilles heel – is your Achilles heel because mm-hmm. it ruptured Good on him. Yeah, that's the only thing I got on him. That's the only thing you make fun of him about. Your Achilles heel sucks. I bet. He was a blast to talk to. Love, love chatting with him. Um, I also love golfing with him, too. 
plays fast. He likes to play for money. I'm a big fan of that. Yeah, he plays real quick. He he hums around that place, dude. I played him in the club championship a handful of years ago. He took me to the 18th hole, by the way, and that's when I was. I think I was still playing at the time. I was like, dude, if I take this L today, I think I was one up going to 18. I was like, if this thing goes to extras or anything, like I'm gonna have I'm gonna have a gang of shit to catch from. You're probably distracted staring at him. It's hard for me to focus. I feel like he's definitely your number one. I have so much hate in my heart. It's hard to it's hard to admit that, but yeah, I mean, dude, if you're gonna pick a guy, show me something better than that, dude. I don't know if it's out there, but he's, yeah, he took me to 18 and I was sweating it for a bit. All right, well, that's going to do it for us. We'll talk to you on next week's Golf Subpar.